Hey, super quick before this video gets started, if you are watching this video before July 27th, 2022, there is an awesome Humble Bundle ebook collection running right now for a lot of Python programming. There's a ton of incredible stuff in here between working with Git, using Jupyter Notebooks, working with PyCharm, Django, Pandas, some super cool stuff with cookie cutter, algorithms, and more. I really, really recommend you check it out if you're interested in Python programming. It is a pay what you want model, so you can spend literally as little as $1. Humble Bundle always has a phenomenal array and top-notch list of ebooks available to you and it supports a great initiative a lot of the proceeds go to charity looks like this one is supporting women who code and the python software foundation if you add the partner equals john hammond variable at the end of url you can support not only charity but also me and the channel so i super appreciate it please go ahead and check it out humble bundle the operation python 2022 software ebook bundle i'll add a link in the description and i hope you can find something that you enjoy okay so in our Active Directory Home Lab series, learning about both building and breaking, we have momentarily switched into the attacker perspective. In the last video, we put together some crack map exec, brute forcing domain user account credentials with weak passwords and a list of usernames that we were able to determine based off of some play pretend OSINT or open source intelligence to gather potential domain usernames, like employee names, things you might find on LinkedIn or on the website, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, in this video, we're going to carry on and continue with that attacker perspective, and we're going to play with Bloodhound. So let's hop over to my computer screen and let's get the party started. I am inside of the Cat Linux virtual machine that I have set up in this exact same environment we've been working with. I have my domain controller that's spinning up and running. I have my management client in case we need it as well as the workstation, but I am going to be working again from that attacker perspective and using Kali Linux. So I'm going to fire up in my terminal. I hit control alt T on my keyboard and we'll change directory into that active directory folder that we've been working out of. This is bear in mind a GitHub repository. So we should be able to push our notes as we need to and maintain everything that we're learning about. If anything, it's just for me to help structure and organize what the heck I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, so we're moving into the hacks directory. Previously, we had the crack map exec folder. And in that we had some users that we were putting together, as you remember, and we had some passwords from the rocku.txt dictionary word list. Now, I took note of the found credentials that we were able to retrieve from crack map exec earlier. I think we're gonna end up going to spend some more time with crack map exec. I don't think I really did that good of a job in the last video showcasing all the cool stuff, but we will cross that bridge when we come to it. For now, let's get back to what we're jumping into, which is Bloodhound. Cool. We've created a directory for that. If you wanted to create a readme.txt file or readme.markdown file, we could take some notes, but I just wanna showcase all this cool stuff. So I'm gonna Google Bloodhound and we get a picture of some cute dogs. Let's look at the Bloodhound GitHub. There we go, that's what I was really looking for. <laughs> anyway, Bloodhound is a single page JavaScript web application built on top of something with something else using something else. It's used to reveal hidden and often unintended relationships, but within an Active Directory or Azure environment. You can use Bloodhound to easily identify highly complex attack paths that would otherwise be impossible to quickly identify in a large domain environment. Defenders can use Bloodhound to identify and eliminate those same attack paths, so both blue and red teams can use Bloodhound to gain a deeper understanding of privileged relationships within an Active Directory environment. There are some incredible people behind this team. Um, they do a lot of phenomenal stuff, and there is some super duper cool things as part of it. So uh, what I want to mention here is the documentation. They say to get started with Bloodhound, check out these docs. Now, uh, this brings you to a good read the docs theme and you can get a little bit more understanding of what this thing is. But the way that they showcase this and being able to actually collect data that is fed into Bloodhound. And let me chat about that for just a moment. Oftentimes when you use Bloodhound, it is using a collector. Uh, and that allows you to be able to retrieve data remotely that you will then feed into the database that you would populate from your own attacker machine. It was using Neo4j, and I didn't say that word earlier, but that is the database that it might end up using to create graph nodes and a super duper cool visual representation of everything inside of the environment. Now, they showcase, and most people often think of using a collector on a domain joined machine as a domain joined user account. 
is you can access the domain. So oftentimes they showcase using like a C-sharp or PowerShell collector and being able to grab the results on a victim, pull it back to your attacker machine and use it remotely. What I wanna show you in this video, while we will still get into some of the Windows-based stuff and using those C-sharp and PowerShell collectors, I wanna show how you can do that from outside and and I don't mean to say that, but I mean using your Kali Linux attacker machine with Python. And as long as you have domain credentials and can see and access the domain controller, like you, not access, but you can, it's within your network visibility, you can still interrogate and get all that data. And that's super duper handy without having to have to rely on, oh, I need access on a victim or I need to have already compromised or gain initial access for a Windows domain inside the environment. But let's talk about it a little bit first. So they're showcasing how you can use tools like Sharphound. Sharphound is one of those collectors. Now, I wanna show us something different, but we do still of course need Bloodhound to be able to view all the data that we collect. So I'll move into the Linux setup here and it shows, hey, we wanna be able to install Java. I am going to blindly trust these commands here and allow that to spin up for me. Needs a pseudo password, totally cool. We can run apt update, excuse me, apt update, so we can grab all the new packages and things that it might have suggested in some of those sources that we wanted to be able to pull down from. And fingers crossed, this will come together for us. Neo4j will automatically pull from that repo when it needs to install Java as part of its install process. Remember, you need Neo4j to be able to access the database that Bloodhound is going to end up using. So we'll grab this wget to grab the key, go ahead and throw it into our sources, update one more time, and fingers crossed. Okay, that's cruising right along. Now we can grab apt transport HTTPS, install that. Again, that will require sudo, so slap that in on the beginning there. And we'll go ahead and install Neo4j in its community edition. Okay, so we'll slap in the Neo4j install. And with that, we now have the command Neo4j. There we go. It knows that it needs to be using Java, so that's what it's working on. But the instructions and the documentation behind us explain what we really need to do here. If you wanted to go ahead and stop Neo4j in case we're already running like a background service or job, that of course would normally lead sudo. So because it's not set up and enabled, okay, no worries. We can honestly just start this up on a front, like in the foreground is really the right word to say it. So whenever we want Bloodhound and we know we're working with it, we can just kind of spin up Neo4j as needed. So if anything, remember that as the steps to go ahead and start Bloodhound. We could use Neo4j console, as it suggested, to go ahead and run it in the foreground, right? That will require pseudo permissions, so I think it's going to yell at me. Yep, there's a little access denied, failed to write the PID file, and uh, we will go ahead, we'll have to go ahead and spin this up with sudo. There we go. Now we'll go ahead and start Neo4j, and it's going to all end up running everything that it needs to. It's kicking off, and we're looking good. I am going to split my screen. I'm going to go ahead and split horizontally so you have a new terminal down here. And we'll let Neo4j just sort of run in the background, but I do want to go ahead and continue on in the documentation instructions. Good, good, good. Now we need to go ahead and download the Bloodhound GUI, or the graphical user interface. We can go ahead and grab that from the latest releases on GitHub. I know Kelly has these in their repositories, but as you probably come to find out, hey, the repositories might have an older version that isn't completely up to date or the most latest release. So it's nice to be able to go grab these from their GitHub pages. There we go. You could use a rolling release, which is sort of unstable if you wanna be on the bleeding edge, or if you wanna go ahead and grab the latest, most recent version uh, that's available for you. We can scroll down and go ahead and grab the Linux I want x80 x64 in my case for a 64-bit pc which is regular intel shenanigans i'm gonna go ahead and save this go ahead and download it good 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 i will move back to the documentations that i was just at previously and we could just simply run it after we've extracted this what i like to do is honestly throw these in my opt directory for like optional tools uh for the moment that is actually owned by root i believe at least is opt owned by root? 
Can I can I just check that out? Yeah. Okay, so it still is. Uh, for the sake of my sanity, I am going to change the ownership on the slash opt directory to my own user for Kali. And that will, of course, need Kali for the password. And now we can go ahead and move into opt momentarily. And let's go ahead and move the downloaded file. Uh, did it just throw it in my home directory? It did. I don't have a downloads folder. So we'll slap that in this current directory with the period. And now we can see that it is currently in this directory. We'll go ahead and unzip that file. Good, good, good. And all that stuff cruises through here for us. Okay. I'm going to rename that directory. So I'm just going to move it to something called like Bloodhound. Uh, if my keyboard comes back to me, wireless batteries are dying or something. I don't know. And now I have a Bloodhound file inside of the Bloodhound folder of opt. Okay, nice and easy. So can I actually check out what that Bloodhound file is? That is our binary. So we would want a dot slash Bloodhound, but we need to mark it as executable, right? So let's see hmod plus x, our Bloodhound binary. And now we can dot slash Bloodhound. Super duper cool. All right, it is kicking together. It shows me a green checkbox or a lot of, hey, a good notification and success that it sees our Neo4j uh, database. I believe the default is Neo4j as the username and Neo4j, if I can type that, as the password. Oh, credentials need to be changed from the Neo4j browser first. Go to localhost port 7474 and change them. All right, so... Let's go follow that instructions. I'll go back to my browser and we want localhost 7474. Cool. Looks like this is setting up Neo4j for us. And honestly, you can choose whatever you'd like for your credentials. I tend to just use Neo4j as the user and then Bloodhound as the password. Uh, this is totally for your own environment. I don't know if you need to be worried about, oh, the security sake of passwords, but I think that works well for us in this case, an example. With that said, Neo4j as our username and Bloodhound as our password. Perfect. Don't need to save that. Ooh, are you yelling at me? Or maybe it needs the default first. Okay, so enter Neo4j as your username, Neo4j as your password, and then it'll ask us, yo, what is the new password that you want? I'll use Bloodhound, Bloodhound, and we can change that password. Cool, looking good. Now it is all set up and we could play with the Neo4j environment in our browser if we really wanted to, but we know we're gonna be kicking this off within Bloodhound. So I'm gonna close that tab and shift windows back to Bloodhound. Now I know my new password is Bloodhound and success. We are now logged in and Bloodhound is gonna start kicking off for us. Now, what you're looking at here is basically nothing right? It's a completely blank screen. There's no data imported into the database and there's nothing for it to show us. That is why we need to go ahead and run one of those collector scripts or collector programs to be able to retrieve and interrogate data from the Active Directory environment. So let's go do that. Remember, this is where I was telling you, we need to be able to go set this up in uh, I want to be able to showcase this in Linux with our bloodhound.py rather than using it on a compromised Windows victim inside of the environment with the Windows domain account. We already have a domain account. So bloodhound, we could click around for the moment, but again, there's nothing in here. Uh, we'll explore the analysis in just a moment, but ultimately we want to be able to go up on the right hand side and like upload data. First, we have to give it some data, right? So let's go ahead and go get some data. I'm gonna move out of this directory because remember we are in our active directory hacks and we can copy the crack map exec found users or found creds into our bloodhound directory. And we'll move into that bloodhound directory and now we'll use a utility called bloodhound python. Bloodhound python is not a command readily installed in Kali. It is not in the repositories that I know of, but we can do our Googling and find it online. So kudos where credit is due. This is a uh, Foxit and they're his repository or that individual, that person, right? Um, and let me show you this. It is a Python based ingester for Bloodhound based on Impacket.
This version of Bloodhound is only compatible with Bloodhound 4.1 or newer. So we got to be using the latest and greatest stuff, which is totally why we downloaded it from the official most recent releases. Now, bear in mind, this has some... Okay, limitations, right? Supports most, but not all of Bloodhound or Sharphound being the original collector, right? And C-Sharp features. You could check out the supported collection methods below, but mainly it's the group policy object methods that are missing. Kerberos authentication support is not yet complete. That's a okay. We'll use some of our domain stuff uh, with what we need here. Now, uh, if you wanted to install this with pip, you very well could, or maybe that's all we really need. We can go ahead and do that. We have pip and it's a Python package installer for us. So we could simply pip install bloodhound or you could clone the repository and set it up as needed. Let's go check it out and try it with this and hopefully it gave us the correct uh, version. Let's see what their latest releases are. Do they have them here? Yeah. Okay, maybe there are tags available. Version 1.01 seems to be, but I'm sure there's a later one. Yeah, in PyPy, wherever it is. Whatever, we can trust it. We know now that we have the Bloodhound Python command added to our path. So when I previously ran Bloodhound attack Python, it didn't work, it told me command not found. But if I create a new terminal, fingers crossed, will I see, I'll zoom in on this, Bloodhound attack. Python, pretty, pretty please. Oh, okay, lame. Do I need to clobber that as like a system pseudo user shenanigans? Or can I do it for tac tac user? Already satisfied, lame. Uh, where did that put it? Let's go ahead and scroll up. There it is. It's installed in home Kali local bin, which is not in the path. So consider adding that directory to the path, or if you prefer to suppress that warning, don't care about the location. So what that means is in my current path directory or uh, environment variable, right? I don't have my user's local bin folder. I don't have Kali local bin. Uh, you can see that present here. But if I were to go ahead and ls inside of that directory, ooh, there's our Bloodhound Python script and file that we need. So we could modify our uh, shell resource file rc or what starts up and runs as we invoke our shell in kali linux that is z shell by default um, but you might be running bash depending on the system that you're in uh, in which case you have a dot bash rc file rather than a z shell file anyway let's fire that up there is a lot of stuff in here i'll close out some of these previous tabs and if we scroll, scroll down to the bottom, we could go ahead and at the very, very end, modify our path. Okay. The way that we do that is by exporting the environment variable. And let's go ahead and set it to the previous value that it was using the dollar sign to retrieve the value from that variable and then using a colon to add the delimiter and specify a new location. We know we want home Kali local bin. So let's go ahead and save that. I hit control S on my keyboard, but we could just save. And when we close out of that, we need to go ahead and re-invoke that shell script. You could do that with the source command so it updates in this current terminal session, or you could open a new terminal. Totally your call. You could also just use a period rather than uh, the word source. But that should do it. And now, if I take a look at my path variable, notice it's different from what we had to begin with. We have added home Kali local bin. Perfect. So I could now run Bloodhound Python and we do not get the command not found error. Now we have the full script to work with. So let's take a look at our found credentials. And you might remember, I think it was Ashley Brown, right? One of our domain users that had the password bubbles. So she can be, that individual, that user can be the local, excuse me, uh, low privileged domain user we'll use to interrogate the domain. And we can see what we come from. So what we could do is actually use Bloodhound Python and read through some of these use case examples here, the options that we can provide. We know we could probably supply our username and password. So let's go ahead and do that. And we'll see if it needs more information like the DC. Yeah, right here. Let's try that. 
and it would probably be good to tell it or specify the domain on its own. We know we're working with xyz.com and we know what the domain controller might be, right? So let's try that out. Let's use Bloodhound Python, tack u, a brown, tack p, bubbles for our username and password. Let's specify the domain as xyz.com and we'll specify the DC as 192.168.111.155, which we, from our attacker perspective, have already enumerated that is the domain controller. If I fire this up, ooh, we get an error. It says the DNS response does not contain an answer to the question, LDAP, any of these things. So what do we do? Well, in the domain environment, it might be really worthwhile to ensure, oh, your domain controller and the domain that you're trying to interrogate, you know what the actual fully qualified domain name right might be rather than using the IP address, the 192.168.111. 155. So could we tell our system, let's go ahead and actually open up our etc. hosts files. You might have heard me mentioning that uh, in our previous video. Can we go ahead and just tell it, look, we know 192.168.111.155 is our domain controller, dc1xyz.com. Or we might as well just call it xyz.com because that's kind of referring to the domain. Is that fair to say? Let's try it and let's see where we go. So I'm going to close that or minimize it. And now let's try and run that exact same command. Well, we haven't really changed anything when we run that exact same command, right? We want to go ahead and specify the DC as dc1xyz.com. How does that look? Oh, no. DNS response does not contain an answer to the question in SRV. So I totally must be making a mistake. If we go back, can I modify this to remove xyz.com? And can we ping this thing? We do know that that is our domain controller, correct? I just wanna go through a little bit of troubleshooting to make sure I'm not insane. Looks good. How about, ooh, if I can type DC1, xyz.com. Yep, right IP address, all good. Let's try setting the domain controller before we specify the domain, in case that's weird, dxyz.com. Okay, keyboard. Ooh, DNS response not contain an answer to the question, LDAP, TCP, and SRV. What is going on? Can I, let's use the domain here, 111155, oh, too many fives. Nope, okay, let's try it without specifying the domain. Ooh, here we go. The specified domain controller looks like an IP address but requires a host name, mm, just as we suspected. So let's change that to our dc1xyz.com and not specify the domain. Can that figure it out smartly for me? Could not find a global catalog server. Assuming the primary DC has this role. If it gives errors, specify either a host name with TAC GC or disable GC resolution with TAC TAC disable auto GC. Could not figure out the domain to query. You could specify this manually uh, with a typo, one L. <laughs> anyway, let's try with disable auto GC. And let's troubleshoot together. Fingers crossed. Now this needs a domain. Can I give it xyz.com and will it behave? No, DNS response does not contain an answer to the question. Lame, what do I have wrong here? Oh, you know what? You know what? It might be cutesy to set this in our etc. host file, but Honestly, we need to be setting this for the way that we resolve other domain names. We need to use this as our domain controller for our attacker machine as if we are inside of the environment, right? So we don't strictly need to change the set of hosts, although that might be nice to do. We need to set that just as well for our name server in etc. resolve.conf. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I probably needed a pseudo on that, didn't I? Yep, because I want to be able to modify that. So 
rather than using my default gateway for this VM, let me tell it to use the domain controller that we know is at 111155. How does that look? Now we still know our dc1xyz.com is there, but we also know that we're going to interrogate that as our own domain name system and DNS server for us. Okay, fingers crossed. Let's run this exact same command that we've built out in the past and let's see if we can pull some data back. Ooh, 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 it's going, it's going. Nice. Okay. So, uh, found one domain, one domain in the forest, two computers, 104 users, heck yeah, 62 groups, and this spat out, if I ls in my current directory, a couple of cool files. This is the JSON file. These are all of the JSON files that we just received and we're able to pull and interrogate by using this Bloodhound collector. So let me show you this. I'm gonna subble this entire directory and we could just carve through and take a look at all of this JSON data. This is pretty awful to look at while well, it is word wrapped. So let me install a package in Sublime Text. Um, let me, is that installing package control? Pretty please. Hello? Cool, package control successfully installed. Control Shift P one more time. Let's install a package for JSON and I wanna use Pretty, pretty JSON, there it is, cool. Pretty JSON, going ahead and installing, good. Now let's use pretty JSON to format JSON. There we go, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so this is gonna show me all of the data that Bloodhound has just received for us by using this Bloodhound Python ingester, all from Linux. We don't have a compromised Windows victim yet. Very, very slick, very, very cool, and these are just computers that it was able to find. This is kind of hard to make sense of, right? Because it's in like a verbose format, but we could do the very, very same with these domains that we've learned about. We know xyz.com, we're able to pull the SID. We could do the same for, what is this, groups? Nice, okay, so now from the attacker perspective, we can find our groups like personnel. We can find our other groups, scrolling down a little bit more, like sales. We could find any of the others that we might have already configured from our developer script? Yep, developers. Cool, cool, cool. And you could do the very, very same for all of our users. Here we found H. Piper, here we found S. Chapman, here we found I. Young, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I wanna let you know that we have only gathered a little bit of information. We were only using the default collection method. Now, Collection methods are the way that Bloodhound will receive and gather information. We saw a little bit of that during the conversations of, oh, what we're using here. But it says, by default, Bloodhound will query LDAP, the lightweight directory access protocol, and the individual computers of the domain to enumerate users, computers, groups, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to change the collection method, you can use the collection method parameter, which supports the following options, very, very similar to Sharphound. Default, group, local admins, RDP, blah, blah, blah. If you want, you can throw the kitchen sink and use all. Run all method of above except for logged on. You can also specify multiple with a comma. Now, I want to fire the kitchen sink, right? So let's go ahead and run that exact same syntax, but use tax C for collection method and all as our parameter. There we go, spitting all that out. And now we should have a little bit more, but I realize I haven't removed the previous ones. Uh, so let's, <laughs> let's do that again and remove the JSON files. Cool, all right. Now we should have a significant amount more information if I go ahead and look at this directory. What do we have here? It's format JSON. Cool, not a lot coming through from the domains, but it was able to pull some interesting service principal names or last logon times or things that were specific to the domain controller machine, DC1. Also grabbing the operating system, also grabbing more information like sessions, constrained or unconstrained delega delegation, uh, privileges and rights, so much cool stuff we could explore. But obviously, as I mentioned, I'm just looking at this in the JSON file. And you know, we want to do something very, very specific in this video, look at Bloodhound. Now, let me chat about this for just a moment. 
Bloodhound is your compass. It is your map. When you're doing Active Directory or internal AD pen tests or anything of the like, always refer back to Bloodhound. Always double check and look whenever you've either gained access to something new, you can mark it as owned or you can, hey, try to see the perspective of the landscape. How can I reach domain admin from this position? Anything of the like. Use Bloodhound as a home base, as HQ. I really, really recommend that. Let's get back to it. All right. So we know we could now fire up Bloodhound and the actual GUI, right? So opt Bloodhound, Bloodhound. We'll go ahead and log in. Neo4j and Bloodhound. And now we can actually upload data with this upload data button up here. Check it out. Uh, let's go into our Bloodhound directory. And I'm gonna select, I'm holding down shift as I'm clicking these or just grabbing the bottom one and hitting open on all of those sweet, cool data. That's gonna ahead and upload it all. We can uh, clear finished and then X out of this if we'd like. And now let's click that little hamburger menu and let's go to the analysis tab. Now, I gotta be honest, click everything. <laughs> go explore, go see what's available to you and go query, ooh, what are the sweet things that we might be able to find like domain admins for the specific domain, like xyz.com. We can see in the domain admins group, this guy over here, we have an administrator account. Administrator being the domain administrator, member of that group. If you wanted to, you could right click on this edge and check out help. And this will explain what it is you are really looking at here. This user is a member of the group domain admins. Can I zoom in on this? No, probably not. Uh, groups in Active Directory grant their members any privileges that the group itself has. That's just inheritance. I'm sure you guys know how groups work. But you can also see how you might be able to abuse this if it's appropriate for that sort of relationship. OPSEC information, references that you might be able to refer to, and really cool links to learn other and more interesting things. So that was one cool thing we could query. We could map domain trusts if there were multiple forests and domains and stuff to be able to enumerate. We could find computers with unsupported operating systems. We're rocking Windows 11 and Windows 2022. We could find principles with DC sync rights if you specify a domain. We're all we're working with is xyz.com right now. And we can go explore all of these. And again, right click on edges that you're interested in. Obviously, right now, our administrator is really the only one with all the power. We'll probably have to make in some other, oh, misconfigurations or weaknesses that we'll be able to exploit as we keep building and playing here. Foreign domain group membership, see if there's anything, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Find computers where there's a domain user that is a local admin. Uh, right now we got none of those, but we can set them up super duper soon. Laps, local admin password solution. Uh, nothing there yet, but we'll play with that soon enough. Find all paths from domain users to high value targets. Not a lot for the moment because we just have boring, lame, regular domain users. But I want to show you that this is a resource. So in our other environment, there's a lot more you could query and interrogate here. We will keep using Bloodhound again as our map, as our compass, while we explore more. But for the moment, these are the cool things. Shortest path to some of those unconstrained delegation systems. Oh, all the enterprise admin groups or key admins, enterprise admins information that might have some more control over the domain controller. Kerberosable accounts, only the Kerberos ticket granting ticket, I believe, TGT. Go back to the analysis tab. Find Kerberos users with most privileges. Find ASREP users. We'll get into ASREP super duper soon. And Pretty soon, in a later video, I do want to show us some of the cool custom queries that we can add. Uh, I got to admit, I'm not a guru slinging some of these custom queries myself, but I know there is a great, great resource and list online for other cool stuff you could query. But this is not the end of Bloodhound. Notice in the very, very top left, you can search for a node. So if we wanted to look at some of the domain groups, can I do that? Or can I just look for groups? Nothing? Not giving me any of that? How about group G Roberts? Ooh, here's a user. Can I look for domain 
users. Oh, cool. Here we go. Domain users would be worthwhile. We can check out domain users at xyz.com. And if I click on this, does it show me some interesting stuff? Now we know that that is a group, right? And we could check out some other interesting node properties. SID, the description, if there are any admins in there, extra properties like the distinguished name. And the cool stuff is in the members and their relationships, right? We know that there are direct members. So if I clicked on this, look at all of these domain users. I'll scroll in here. And this is where we could find our good friend S. Martin or F. McDonald. How did we randomly get that name? That's pretty awesome. Uh, can we find our good friend A. Brown? We might be able to just type that in, right? Yeah, so a brown at xyz.com. If we want to click on this individual, we could learn a little bit more about them specifically. Last logon, if they're an enabled account. Uh, have we compromised them? Well, we know that they're, we know their username, right? We know their credentials and their password. So what we can do is we can right click on that user and mark as owned. We know the credential for that account. We could do that with all the others. And that will help Bloodhound better determine new paths that are more accessible and open to us if we wanted to calculate from this amount of privileges, how can I get to something else with higher privileges? Super duper cool. Extra properties that we'd be able to retrieve. Yeah, Abigail Brown. Oh, it was Abigail. I was saying Ashley. Man, I need to take care of my people better, right? <laughs> Group memberships. These are the first degree ones that we could see. Uh, we know we were looking at, ooh, she's in the executives group. And scroll down, we know she is a member of the domain users. We can go back to her. Did I just like fly? Okay, cool. Now it's just trying to render. <laughs> and that is the beginning. That is just scratching the surface of what you can do with Bloodhound. You could check out local admin rights if we had them. You could check out execution rights between RDP, remote desktop protocol, SQL, etc., or constrained, unconstrained delegation. We'll talk about that very, very soon. Uh, or control rights, privileges and permissions and things that it might be able to do. Whenever you see a number here, I think it's worth checking out just to get a feeling for what is doing what. Obviously, a lot of the high value, like strong accounts, like enterprise admins or domain admins will have ultimate power, generic all, and uh, like the ability to do anything on every user because they're the administrators. And there's other stuff we could explore. So again, I am scratching the surface of what we can do with Bloodhound. But I wanted to present it to you and I wanted to show it to you how you can actually query this data, again, without needing to compromise a target like a Windows machine with a domain user account. If you just have the domain account, if you just have credentials for a low privilege domain user, you can use that Bloodhound collector written in Python from your own attacking machine. And that I hope is very, very cool and very, very useful for you. Trust me, of course, we're gonna get into the other stuff, but I just wanted to present that to you. And hopefully we'll keep bringing us back to Bloodhound to again, explore more and see what else is available to us and accessible. But for the moment, hopefully that was pretty cool. Uh, and now we'll start to explore what more damage could be done inside of our Active Directory environment. But I think that's it. We'll close all these terminals and we'll start to shut this thing down. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I'm having fun with this series. I don't know if you can tell. Uh, I'm bumping into walls. I'm, hey, making some mistakes. I'm probably goofing off a little bit here and there, but I hope that that shows you like it's okay to troubleshoot. It's okay to Google and do some quick tiptoe tap dancing, like try and learn stuff. And hey, if you make some mistakes, that's a-okay. Just keep exploring. That's the fun of it all. Uh, and in the next video, we're going to keep doing some super cool things, really get into some of those local admins and see, can we then compromise an account? And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Hope you enjoy. Hey, please do all those YouTube algorithm things if you are enjoying these videos in this series. If you could like the video, if you could leave a comment, if you could subscribe, that lets me know that you want to see more of this and keeps motivating me to create and do more. Uh, also, I'm hopefully trying to add some cool outro effects or like some hey and affiliates and other folks that I think are really, really great and cool organizations and people. So if you like more education, go check those out and uh, I'll see you in the next video, everybody. I love you. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye.